right, so curve sketching. Let's talk about curve sketching for rational functions. Now, curve sketching just means graph drawing, basically. And rational functions are a little bit more fun than just using regular polynomials and trying to graph them without using a calculator or Wolfram Alpha or anything like that. So, I know when I say rational function, you should know that I'm talking about a function that is a quotient, like 3x squared minus 9 over uh, x to the fifth plus 7 squared, right? This is a rational function. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, isn't every single function a rational function? Because we could just take, uh, you know, ln, uh, ln x and put it over 1, and oh, voila, it's a quotient. It's a rational function. Yes. All functions are technically rational functions because you can just put them over 1. But we're ignoring the technicality for the purpose of this video. We're talking about the type of rational function that I first showed an example of. Uh, which is two distinct values over each other with the denominator not equaling one. So there are a couple of steps. It's pretty straightforward. It's just easy to get tripped up on the procedural stuff to sketching a graph of a function. So you've been given a function. I'm not going to delve into a specific function for this example. I'm just talking about concepts. So you have imaginary function. You're welcome. There you go. So the first thing you want to do is you want to find the zeros and the critical values of that function. You want to find its zeros, which just means where does f of x equal zero, and then you want to find critical values, which is f of x equals zero, f prime of x equals zero, and f double prime, or the second derivative of x equals zero. So the way you do this is you set your equation equal to zero. You have f of x, you set it equal to zero, you get your zeros when you do that arithmetic, and you do the algebra there that's required. Then you take the derivative of your function, you say f prime of x, then you get what that is, you get that value, and then you say that value equals zero, and this gives you your critical values for f prime, for the first derivative. You then take the derivative of the original function, so we said that was v in this case, and you take the prime of the derivative. So the derivative of the derivative is the second derivative. So you take this and you get v2, or our second derivative, we'll just call it v2 for the purposes of this little exercise here. So you now take that and you set that equal to zero and you have found the critical values for uh, f, f prime, and f double prime. So you're done with your first step. So let's just come over here and write down some critical values arbitrarily over here. Let's say, first off, zeros. All right, our zeros for this function were uh, negative 2 and 7. So those were the zeros. And our critical values were f prime equals 0 at, uh, let's make it really easy on ourselves, negative 4 and f double prime equals 0 at 7. Let me do that again, at 7. So we've got our critical values, we've got our zeros. We're just making up these numbers. The specific numbers do not matter for the purposes of this example. The second step is we need to go ahead and find our asymptotes. Now, if you remember, of course, an asymptote is a point on a function that uh, the, it's a point on the graph that the function cannot ever touch, but it can approach it to an infinitesimally small degree. You can just never, ever, ever actually come in contact with it. On this sample graph that I have here, this is just of some function. I just drew it out of my head. It's not for a specific function. These green dashed lines represent vertical and horizontal asymptotes. And the uh, orange line is our f of x. And so, once again, all we're talking about here is how do we get from a function, in this case a rational function, to our graph. Now, the fact that the function is rational so far has not made any difference. When we get to finding asymptotes, it's going to make asymptotes, it's going to make a difference. The vertical asymptotes can be found by setting the denominator equal to zero. And the horizontal asymptotes can be found by setting the numerator equal to zero. So that's all you have to do, and you only need to do that for the original function. Don't worry about setting the primes, the numerator and denominator of the primes, if the primes are still rational, equal to zero. Don't worry about any of that. Now the next step is to find our y-intercept, and we do this by everywhere in the function that there is an x, we replace that with a zero. So a quick example with an arbitrary function here, if we have 3x squared uh, plus 1 over 
uh, 2x plus 9. We replace this with 0 here, and we're going to get 3 times 0 squared is nothing, so we just have 1 on the top, and 2 times 0 is nothing, so we just get 1 ninth. So our y-intercept would be at 1 over 9. Now, what if your function is something like this? You don't always have to have a y-intercept, because what if this was the function that you were given? 3x over x, okay? This is 0 over 0. Even, okay, 3x plus 1 is 1 over 0. Anything over 0 is undefined because itself is an asymptote. So what would that mean? That would mean that the y-axis itself is a vertical asymptote. So that's how you're going to go about finding your y-intercepts is by replacing all of the x's in the original function with 0. The fourth step is to find intervals of increase and decrease and concavity, and that's where these values come in. So what you're going to want to do is make a table over here. You're going to have two zeros on this table. I've labeled it as 0, 1, and 0, 2. This would, these would be actual numbers. If this were a real function, you would have actual numbers here. And so, um, oh, let's go ahead and write in our y-intercept. Let's say our y-intercept was 4. And uh, you're going to have uh, your x here, your first x-intercept, your second x-intercept. You could have as many as you wanted. Uh, as many as the function dictated, and then you're going to have points in between those x-intercepts. What you're going to want to do is say, here's your x-intercepts, here's your critical values. When you plug in your, this x-intercept into f prime, do you get a positive or a negative number at each of these points? So for the point in between, do you get a positive or a negative number? For the first x-intercept, do you get a positive or a negative number? For the second x-intercept, do you get a positive or a negative number when plugging those values into the function that f prime is? And then you're going to do the exact same thing for f double prime. So let's go in and let's say we did all that math and we got that this is positive, 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 negative, and that this is negative, positive, negative, positive. So We've got these values. What does this mean? This tells us our increase, our decrease, and our concavity. Everywhere f are intervals of increasing and decreasing in our concavity. Make that correct there. So everywhere that you see f prime for these values being positive, that means that your function is increasing. Everywhere that you see it being negative, that means your function is decreasing. Everywhere that f double prime, the second derivative, is negative, that means that your function is concave down. And everywhere your function uh, is positive, every, everywhere f double prime is positive, that means your function is concave up. So we can go in and we can just make a, a quick little chart here. We have a positive, negative, so that means this is increasing and it's concave down. This is increasing and it is concave up. This is increasing, concave down. This is decreasing concave up because negative, positive, positive, negative. So always positive always increasing, uh, negative always decreasing for f prime. For f double prime, negative means concave down, positive means concave up. What do we mean by that? Here's a concave down function that's really obvious. Here's a concave up function. All it has to do with is the concavity like in Concavity, I mean, you can't get, I can't make it any simpler than that. This is, you know, concave or convex, these have concavity pointing up and concavity pointing down. So, uh, here is what it, your, here's a handy chart you can have if f double prime is greater than zero and f prime is greater than zero, then you're going to have your function increasing and concave down. If f double prime is greater than zero and f prime is greater than zero, then it's increasing and up. If f prime is less than zero and f double prime is less than zero, you have a decreasing down, concave down function. If f double prime is greater than zero and f prime is less than zero, then your function is decreasing, but it's concave up. This chart is going to save you so much work if you have that. So we do that. We get all of these uh, things. We figured out our asymptotes. Let's say we have arbitrary vertical asymptote at... Uh, uh, 3 and an arbitrary horizontal asymptote at 2. So, and also, let's say we have a vertical asymptote at 0. y equals 0 because when we checked our uh, y-intercept, we found that it was, a, it was an undefined function. We had 0 on the bottom of that rational. So, this is all you have to do to get set up. Now we're going to actually put all of this onto the graph and show you how we get from all of these numbers to actually putting something onto a graph. So we're putting everything on the graph now. 
Now, when we got these zeros, these asymptotes, these y-intercepts, all these critical values, this is just saying, oh, if we were using uh, a certain function and we got this, we'd just write it down over here. This has nothing to do with how this arbitrary imaginary function is actually going to look. So, I want to make sure that nobody is paying attention to any of this right now because this does not in any way apply to the next portion. Only this chart right here, this sign chart, where we came up with imaginary values for f prime and f double prime. So up until our first zero, which is at this arbitrary point here, zero, one, our function, it comes from negative infinity, and it comes increasing concave down. So how does that look? Well, we go over to our chart and we say that this is increasing concave down, so it's going to look like that. So until we get to a point number one, we look like this. Then we hit this zero, and then from there, on the other side of this zero, we are increasing concave up. So we change our concavity. What does increasing concave up look like? It looks just like this. So we go like this until we're bounded by this asymptote. We can't go past it, so we're going to keep approaching this asymptote forever and ever and ever and ever and not touching it. So we have this portion that is increasing concave up. We have this portion that is, uh, sorry, increasing concave down, and this portion that is increasing concave up. Now, once we get to our other side of the asymptote, it looks like we are increasing concave down. So what does that look like? Increasing concave down, just like we had over here. So our function comes up like this until we hit our second zero. It looks exactly the same. And then on the other side of that zero, we are decreasing concave up. So now that we're decreasing concave up, that looks like this. So ah, we go back the same way. So now that we've, uh, we've done this, and this would this will look more like this. That's a, that, you know, it's a polynomial that can't have a you know, sharp point. So it's going to have more of a, a curved point at the end of it like that. So this is how you would put it onto the graph. Most graphs are going to be a lot more complicated than this. But we just, wanted, we just wanted to use a really simple sign chart and a graph with only one asymptote. So there you go. Here's your steps. Find your zeros of the function find, and your critical values for f, f prime, and f double prime. Find your asymptote, your, vor, your vertical asymptote and your horizontal asymptote. Find your y-intercepts. Find your intervals of increase and decrease and find your concavity. And you're good to go. Make your chart. Write everything down. Use your chart. Look at this little... Uh, Graph, not a graph, this little uh, chart, sure, this little chart here, and then plug in your values on your graph and graph your curve depending on if it's increasing, decreasing, concave up, or concave down, and you're done.